Neuroethology, Wikipedia article audio. Neuroethology is the evolutionary and comparative approach to the study of animal behavior and its underlying mechanistic control by the nervous system. This interdisciplinary branch of behavioral neuroscience endeavors to understand how the central nervous system translates biologically relevant stimuli into natural behavior. For example, Many bats are capable of echolocation which is used for prey capture and navigation. The auditory system of bats is often cited as an example for how acoustic properties of sounds can be converted into a sensory map of behaviorally relevant features of sounds. Neuroethologists hope to uncover general principles of the nervous system from the study of animals with exaggerated or specialized behaviors. Philosophy History Modern Neuroethology Application to Technology Case Studies Jamming Avoidance Response Feature Analysis in Toad Vision Computational Neuroethology Model Systems Sources Textbooks Articles As its name implies, neuroethology is a multidisciplinary field composed of neurobiology and ethology. A central theme of the field of neuroethology, delineating it from other branches of neuroscience, is this focus on natural behavior, which may be thought of as those behaviors generated through means of natural selection rather than behaviors in disease states, or behavioral tasks that are particular to the laboratory. Neuroethology is an integrative approach to the study of animal behavior that draws upon several disciplines. Its approach stems from the theory that animals' nervous systems have evolved to address problems of sensing and acting in certain environmental niches and that their nervous systems are best understood in the context of the problems they have evolved to solve. In accordance with Crow's principle, neuroethologists often study animals that are specialists in the behavior the researcher wishes to study e.g. honeybees and social behavior, bat echolocation, owl sound localization, etc. The scope of neuroethological inquiry might be summarized by Jörg Peter Ewert, a pioneer of neuroethology, when he considers the types of questions central to neuroethology in his 1980 introductory text to the field. Often central to addressing questions in neuroethology are comparative methodologies, drawing upon knowledge about related organisms' nervous systems, anatomies, life histories, behaviors, and environmental niches. While it is not unusual for many types of neurobiology experiments to give rise to behavioral questions, many neuroethologists often begin their research programs by observing a species' behavior in its natural environment. Other approaches to understanding nervous systems include the systems identification approach, popular in engineering. The idea is to stimulate the system using a non-natural stimulus with certain properties. The system's response to the stimulus may be used to analyze the operation of the system. Such an approach is useful for linear systems, but the nervous system is notoriously non-linear and neuroethologists argue that such an approach is limited. This argument is supported by experiments in the auditory system, which show that neural responses to complex sounds, like social calls, cannot be predicted by the knowledge gained from studying the responses due to pure tones. This is because of the nonlinearity of the system. Modern neuroethology is largely influenced by the research techniques used. Neural approaches are necessarily very diverse, as is evident through the variety of questions asked, measuring techniques used, relationships explored, and model systems employed. Techniques utilized since 1984 include the use of intracellular dyes, 
which make maps of identified neurons possible, and the use of brain slices, which bring vertebrate brains into better observation through intracellular electrodes. Currently, other fields toward which neuroethology may be headed include computational neuroscience, molecular genetics, neuroendocrinology, and epigenetics. The existing field of neural modeling may also expand into neuroethological terrain, due to its practical uses in robotics. In all this, Neuroethologists must use the right level of simplicity to effectively guide research towards accomplishing the goals of neuroethology. Critics of neuroethology might consider it a branch of neuroscience concerned with animal trivia. Though neuroethological subjects tend not to be traditional neurobiological model systems, Neuroethological approaches emphasizing comparative methods have uncovered many concepts central to neuroscience as a whole, such as lateral inhibition, coincidence detection, and sensory maps. The discipline of neuroethology has also discovered and explained the only vertebrate behavior for which the entire neural circuit has been described, the electric fish jamming avoidance response. Beyond its conceptual contributions, neuroethology makes indirect contributions to advancing human health. By understanding simpler nervous systems, many clinicians have used concepts uncovered by neuroethology and other branches of neuroscience to develop treatments for devastating human diseases. The field of neuroethology owes part of its existence to the establishment of ethology as a unique discipline within the discipline of zoology. Although animal behavior had been studied since the time of Aristotle, it was not until the early 20th century that ethology finally became distinguished from natural science and ecology. The main catalysts behind this new distinction were the research and writings of Conrad Lorenz and Nico Tinbergen. Conrad Lorenz was born in Austria in 1903, and is widely known for his contribution of the theory of fixed action patterns, endogenous, instinctive behaviors involving a complex sequence of movements that are triggered by a certain kind of stimulus. This sequence always proceeds to completion, even if the original stimulus is removed. It is also species-specific and performed by nearly all members. Lorenz constructed his famous hydraulic model to help illustrate this concept, as well as the concept of action-specific energy, or drives. Nico Tinbergen was born in the Netherlands in 1907 and worked closely with Lorentz in the development of the FAP theory, their studies focused on the egg retrieval response of nesting geese. Tinbergen performed extensive research on the releasing mechanisms of particular FAPs, and used the bill-pecking behavior of baby herring gulls as his model system. This led to the concept of the supernormal stimulus. Tinbergen is also well known for his four questions that he believed ethologists should be asking about any given animal behavior, among these is that of the mechanism of the behavior, on a physiological, neural, and molecular level, and this question can be thought of in many regards as the keystone question in neuroethology. Tinbergen also emphasized the need for ethologists and neurophysiologists to work together in their studies a unity that has become a reality in the field of neuroethology. Unlike behaviorism, which studied animals' reactions to non-natural stimuli in artificial, laboratory conditions, ethology sought to categorize and analyze the natural behaviors of animals in a field setting. Similarly, neuroethology asks questions about the neural basis of naturally occurring behaviors, and seeks to mimic the natural context as much as possible in the laboratory. Although the development of ethology as a distinct discipline was crucial to the advent of neuroethology, equally important was the development of a more comprehensive understanding of neuroscience. 
Contributors to this new understanding were the Spanish neuroanatomist, Ramon Y. Cajal, and physiologists Charles Sherrington, Edgar Adrian, Alan Hodgkin, and Andrew Huxley. Charles Sherrington, who was born in Great Britain in 1857, is famous for his work on the nerve synapse as the site of transmission of nerve impulses, and for his work on reflexes in the spinal cord. His research also led him to hypothesize that every muscular activation is coupled to an inhibition of the opposing muscle. He was awarded a Nobel Prize for his work in 1932 along with Lord Edgar Adrian who made the first physiological recordings of neural activity from single nerve fibers. Alan Hodgkin and Andrew Huxley are known for their collaborative effort to understand the production of action potentials in the giant axons of squid. The pair also proposed the existence of ion channels to facilitate action potential initiation, and were awarded the Nobel Prize in 1963 for their efforts. As a result of this pioneering research, Many scientists then sought to connect the physiological aspects of the nervous and sensory systems to specific behaviors. These scientists Carl von Frisch, Erich von Holst, and Theodore Bullock are frequently referred to as the fathers of neuroethology. Neuroethology did not really come into its own, though, until the 1970s and 1980s, when new, Sophisticated experimental methods allowed researchers such as Masakazu Kanashi, Walter Heiligenberg, Jörg Peter Ewert, and others to study the neural circuits underlying verifiable behavior. The International Society for Neuroethology represents the present discipline of neuroethology, which was founded on the occasion of the NATO Advanced Study Institute Advances in Vertebrate Neuroethology organized by J.P. Ewert, D.J. Engel and R.R. Capra NICA, held at the University of Kassel in Hofgeismar, Germany. Its first president was Theodore H. Bullock. The Society has met every three years since its first meeting in Tokyo in 1986. Its membership draws from many research programs around the world, many of its members are students and faculty members from medical schools and neurobiology departments from various universities. Modern advances in neurophysiology techniques have enabled more exacting approaches in an ever-increasing number of animal systems, as size limitations are being dramatically overcome. Survey of the most recent Congress of the ISN meeting symposia topics gives some idea of the field's breadth. Neuroethology can help create advancements in technology through an advanced understanding of animal behavior. Model systems were generalized from the study of simple and related animals to humans. For example, the neuronal cortical space map discovered in bats, a specialized champion of hearing and navigating, elucidated the concept of a computational space map. In addition, the discovery of the space map in the barn owl led to the first neuronal example of the Jeffress model. This understanding is translatable to understanding spatial localization in humans, a mammalian relative of the bat. Today, knowledge learned from neuroethology are being applied in new technologies. For example, Randall Beer and his colleagues used algorithms learned from insect walking behavior to create robots designed to walk on uneven surfaces. Neuroethology and technology contribute to one another bidirectionally. Neuroethologists seek to understand the neural basis of a behavior as it would occur in an animal's natural environment but the techniques for neurophysiological analysis are lab-based, and cannot be performed in the field setting. This dichotomy between field and lab studies poses a challenge for neuroethology. From the neurophysiology perspective, experiments must be designed for controls and objective rigor, 
which contrasts with the ethology perspective that the experiment be applicable to the animal's natural condition, which is uncontrolled, or subject to the dynamics of the environment. An early example of this is when Walter Rudolph Hess developed focal brain stimulation technique to examine a cat's brain controls of vegetative functions in addition to other behaviors. Even though this was a breakthrough in technological abilities and technique, it was not used by many neuroethologists originally because it compromised a cat's natural state, and, therefore, in their minds, devalued the experiment's relevance to real situations. When intellectual obstacles like this were overcome, it led to a golden age of neuroethology, by focusing on simple and robust forms of behavior, and by applying modern neurobiological methods to explore the entire chain of sensory and neural mechanisms underlying these behaviors. New technology allows neuroethologists to attach electrodes to even very sensitive parts of an animal such as its brain while it interacts with its environment. The founders of neuroethology ushered this understanding and incorporated technology and creative experimental design. Since then even indirect technological advancements such as battery-powered and waterproofed instruments have allowed neuroethologists to mimic natural conditions in the lab while they study behaviors objectively. In addition, the electronics required for amplifying neural signals and for transmitting them over a certain distance have enabled neuroscientists to record from behaving animals performing activities in naturalistic environments. Emerging technologies can complement neuroethology, augmenting the feasibility of this valuable perspective of natural neurophysiology. Another challenge, and perhaps part of the beauty of neuroethology, is experimental design. The value of neuroethological criteria speak to the reliability of these experiments because these discoveries represent behavior in the environments in which they evolved. Neuroethologists foresee future advancements through using new technologies and techniques, such as computational neuroscience, neuroendocrinology, and molecular genetics that mimic natural environments. In 1963, Akira Watanabe and Kimahisa Takeda discovered the behavior of the jamming avoidance response in the knife fish Eigenmania SP. In collaboration with T.H. Bullock and colleagues, the behavior was further developed. Finally, the work of W. Heiligenberg expanded it into a full neuroethology study by examining the series of neural connections that led to the behavior. Eigenmania is a weakly electric fish that can generate electric discharges through electrocytes in its tail. Furthermore, it has the ability to electrolocate by analyzing the perturbations in its electric field. However, when the frequency of a neighboring fish's current is very close to that of its own, the fish will avoid having their signals interfere through a behavior known as jamming avoidance response. If the neighbor's frequency is higher than the fish's discharge frequency, the fish will lower its frequency, and vice versa. The sign of the frequency difference is determined by analyzing the beat pattern of the incoming interference which consists of the combination of the two fish's discharge patterns. Neuroethologists performed several experiments under Eigenmania's natural conditions to study how it determined the sign of the frequency difference. They manipulated the fish's discharge by injecting it with curare which prevented its natural electric organ from discharging. Then, an electrode was placed in its mouth and another was placed at the tip of its tail. Likewise, the neighboring fish's electric field was mimicked using another set of electrodes. This experiment allowed neuroethologists to manipulate different discharge frequencies and observe the fish's behavior. From the results, they were able to conclude that the electric field frequency, rather than an internal frequency measure, was used as a reference. 
This experiment is significant in that not only does it reveal a crucial neural mechanism underlying the behavior but also demonstrates the value neuroethologists place on studying animals in their natural habitats. The recognition of prey and predators in the toad was first studied in depth by Jörg Peter Ewert. He began by observing the natural prey-catching behavior of the common toad and concluded that the animal followed a sequence that consisted of stalking, binocular fixation, snapping, swallowing and mouth wiping. However, initially, the toad's actions were dependent on specific features of the sensory stimulus, whether it demonstrated worm or anti-worm configurations. It was observed that the worm configuration, which signaled prey, was initiated by movement along the object's long axis, whereas anti-worm configuration, which signaled predator, was due to movement along the short axis. Ewart and co-workers adopted a variety of methods to study the predator versus prey behavior response. They conducted recording experiments where they inserted electrodes into the brain, while the toad was presented with worm or anti-worm stimuli. This technique was repeated at different levels of the visual system and also allowed feature detectors to be identified. In focus was the discovery of prey-selective neurons in the optic tectum, whose axons could be traced towards the snapping pattern generating cells in the hypoglossal nucleus. The discharge patterns of prey-selective tectal neurons in response to prey objects in freely moving toads predicted prey-catching reactions such as snapping. Another approach, called stimulation experiment, was carried out in freely moving toads. Focal electrical stimuli were applied to different regions of the brain, and the toad's response was observed. When the thalamic pretectal region was stimulated, the toad exhibited escape responses, but when the tectum was stimulated in an area close to prey-selective neurons, the toad engaged in prey-catching behavior. Furthermore, Neuroanatomical experiments were carried out where the toad's thalamic pretectal slash tectal connection was lesioned and the resulting deficit noted, the prey-selective properties were abolished both in the responses of prey-selective neurons and in the prey-catching behavior. These and other experiments suggest that prey-selectivity results from pretectotectal influences. Ewart and co-workers showed in toads that there are stimulus-response mediating pathways that translate perception into action. In addition there are modulatory loops that initiate, modify or specify this mediation. Regarding the latter, for example, the telencephalic caudal ventral striatum is involved in a loop gating the stimulus-response mediation in a manner of directed attention. The telencephalic ventral medial pallium, however, is involved in loops that either modify prey selection due to associative learning or specify prey selection due to non-associative learning, respectively. Computational neuroethology or CNE is concerned with the computer modeling of the neural mechanisms underlying animal behaviors. Computational neuroethology was first argued for in depth by Randall Beer and by Dave Cliff both of whom acknowledged the strong influence of Michael Arbib's Rana Computatrix computational model of neural mechanisms for visual guidance in frogs and toads. CNE systems work within a closed-loop environment, that is, they perceive their environment directly, rather than through human input as is typical in AI systems. For example, Barlow ETAL developed a time-dependent model for the retina of the horseshoe crab Limulus polyphemus on a connection machine. Instead of feeding the model retina with idealized input signals, they exposed the simulation to digitized video sequences made underwater, and compared its response with those of real animals. Comparative aspects of spatial memory, influences of higher processing centers in active sensing, 
animal signaling plasticity over many time scales, song production and learning in passerine birds, primate sociality, optimal function of sensory systems, neuronal complexity in behavior, contributions of genes to behavior, eye and head movement, hormonal actions in brain and behavior, cognition in insects.